The previous video told you the basic terms for characteristics of minerals, but did not go further in depth. This video will tell you the subtopics for each of those characteristics, and the next video will show you how we use those characteristics along with our identification tools and resources to actually go through the steps on how to ID a mineral. So to go for our first characteristics, finding the color. This one is the easiest, hands down, unless you're colorblind, but you can go and look at the specimen and say, that is yellow, that is blue, this one is blue, this one is yellow purple, and this one here is a clear to white color. Now these three specimens are all fluorite. These are all the same mineral. However, the color can vary because of trace impurities within the specimen. Because of that, because you can have a huge variation based off of impurities or perhaps a difference in what's called the luster, which we'll get to, you can have the same mineral have different appearances and it makes color a poor diagnostic tool. Sometimes it can be very, very easy, such as with this olivine. We say olivine is olive green and when you see something that looks like these two, you know it's olivine. But you have to look at other characteristics, such as the texture, such as the way the light bounces off of it, to further identify or narrow down what your specimen is. So here we have a specimen of pyrite, fool's gold. You see how the light's bouncing off of it? It's shiny. So when you're looking at the color of this, you would say gold, yellow. You would describe it using brighter colors. However, when you get down to what is the next characteristic, the streak, you can find the color of the powdered mineral. So if I were to crush up this specimen, what color would that powder be? And that color would actually be more consistent from one specimen of a mineral to the next versus the color of a hand sample, which can vary quite widely. So with this pyrite here, it's iron and sulfur, I'm going to grind it against what's called my streak plate to find the streak color. So a streak plate is a square of unglazed porcelain. Porcelain can break, so I would never find the streak of something while holding it in my hand. That could crack the tile and cut my hand. So you lay your streak plate flat on the table. I have two white streak plates here. This one has been used. You can see the different colors. This one is brand new and clean, so you can see the outcome of me doing a streak test. Here we have a black streak plate, and you'll see the utility of that shortly. So here I'm taking the pyrite, and although the hand sample is shiny, gold, yellow color, when I create a streak on my streak plate, you see that it leaves a brown to black streak. When I leave a streak with this one here, this blue specimen, you see that the blue streak left behind is a little bit lighter and matches the powdered edge where I did the streak of the specimen. Now I'm going to do a streak with the sulfur specimen. You see that the hand sample is yellow. When I left a streak, it leaves a barely perceptible line. It's kind of a white yellow line. So let's say you did that on your white streak plate, but you can't quite see the color and you're not sure if there's truly a line there. This is when the black streak plate comes in handy. You can tell if you're truly leaving a line. And there we have the yellow white powder show up and be a lot more visible. Some specimen are too hard to leave behind a streak. So this one here is a very hard mineral. It's not going to give way when I rub it to a porcelain square. Try to rub it there, no line is left. But just to double check, I'll try it on my black streak plate and there's no new markings. You still have just the gray scratches that were already there. So this one is too hard to leave a streak. But anytime that you have both the hand sample and the streak, you can now start to move through an ID flow chart, as you'll see in the next video, and begin to narrow down what specimen you have. The next characteristic that is listed says cleavage or fracture. The word cleavage has to do with like cleaving. If you think of a meat cleaver, a knife, something that can cut things in half. The way a specimen cleaves has to do with how it would break naturally. Now I'm not going to drop this chunk of salt, but if I were to drop it, as I mentioned in our previous video on the 
crystal habit or crystal shapes of salt, it would break into cubes, just like all the little tiny salt pieces you eat on your dinner or, or whatever, those are little tiny cubes. So this has a cubic cleavage habit. If you look at it, you can see that it has little right angles. Every time it breaks, it naturally breaks along right angles. So to find the cleavage planes, you would count the number of parallel surfaces on a specimen. So here, this rectangle, rectangles and dice and cubes, they have six sides. That's easy to remember because on a dice, the highest number is six, or on a die, the highest number is six. So if you're looking for the number of paired parallel planes, anytime you have a set of two sides that are going parallel and match each other, if you're looking for a set of parallel planes and you know a cube has six sides, that means it has three parallel planes. So here we have a rectangle and we're going to find those three parallel planes. We have one, two, and three. So this has three planes of cleavage. Not all minerals break regularly. This one here has broken off with right angles. A calcite also has three planes of cleavage, but it breaks off on these slanted or squished rectangular angles, but it still has three planes of cleavage. So we have one, two, and three paired parallel sides. Finding the planes of cleavage is often tricky for students who are in class. The specimen that I use to indicate how to easily find a plane of cleavage is this one here. It's called muscovite. So muscovite gets its name because it was previously found abundantly in and around Moscow. Muscovite, it comes from the word for Muscovy glass. It comes off really easily in sheets. Whoop. There's its cleavage plane. Cleaves along this plane very easily. And you can see the light passes right through it. So back before technology to create glass out of liquid silicates, and I'll get into the mineral class silicates in a future video, before the technology to create glass was created, people would use sheets of this naturally occurring mineral as glass. So muscovite is a Muscovy glass. And here it has one plane of cleavage. We have one set of parallel faces that will show where it breaks off easily. And I did, did that right in front of you. I broke it off, that's its cleavage plane, it cleaved right there. The other sides are irregular. So it has one cleavage plane and the rest is irregular. Some minerals are entirely irregular. If I were to drop this chunk here, it would break off just higgledy-piggledy. You would have no sets of parallel lines. You would have no regularity or predictability in the way it would break. That's what we call a fracture. And there are two kinds of fractures. One is when it just goes however. There's no pattern to it at all. And we call it an irregular fracture. The other kind of fracture is called conchoidal. And conchoidal fractures can be seen in specimen like obsidian. So I'm going to grab an obsidian to show you that conchoidal fracture very quickly. Here we have a specimen of obsidian. And you can see the way the light is bouncing off of it. You have those concentric rings. That is a conchoidal fracture as compared to something like a irregular fracture where you have no patterns of how it breaks. The next characteristic is luster. Luster is how the light bounces off of a specimen. So with this muscovite, it might look metallic, but it's actually what's termed vitreous or glassy. You'll see that word also in the PowerPoint. To identify when something is glassy rather than metallic, Look and see if light will pass through. So I've got this little flashlight here. Oop, go, flashlight. And you see the light passes right through it just like glass. So it might look metallic, however it is vitreous or glassy because the light can pass right through it. The pyrite is truly metallic. There is no light passing through here. Our calcite is also vitreous. You can see the light passes right through it beautifully. And here we have another sheet silicate with one plane of cleavage like muscovite. This one's called lapidolite. And the light passes through. This one is vitreous. So vitreous or glassy is one of our lusters. Another easy to identify luster is called earthy. So when something is dull or dirty looking, you don't see any of the light bouncing back into your eyes. Instead, it's scattered, 
creating a non-shiny appearance. You have a dull or earthy luster. We have the metallic luster, as can be seen in this lead-based mineral called galena. And it's shiny, just like you would see on you know, a cookie sheet or a coin. It's not necessarily going to be pretty, just shiny as you would expect a metal to be. That is why it's called metallic. Another one of our lusters is fibrous. And it's weird to think of a rock being fibrous, but if you look really closely at something like this, you can see there's little lines or striations or chunks of crystals that almost looks like a close-up of silk. So this is fibrous or silky. This one's luster is also fibrous. It looks like you've got little sticks of the mineral all bundled together. Here we have one that is both fibrous and glassy. So you can see the fibers, and this is almost like fiber optics, this one, because the light passes right through it, even though it appears to be fibrous. This is fibrous and glassy, so you can sometimes have two different lusters on the same single hand piece, or as we have with hematite, two specimen having different lusters. So this specimen of hematite has a metallic, you can really see the shininess of the iron here, this one has a metallic luster, whilst this one has an earthy luster. Here we have olivine. Olivine has the little glassy chunks that if you shine a light through them, you can kind of see the light is able, oop, there we go, the light is kind of able to pass through those crystals. So our olivine crystals are vitreous, even though when the crystals are very small, it might not look quite as pretty. But you can see if you hold the light right up next to it that the light is passing through the individual crystals. Another type of luster that we have is soapy, waxy, or resinous. So this piece here, this is talc. This is what gets crushed up and put into uh, powders, makes, makeups. So this talc here if I were to rub it, it feels almost slippery or soapy. It has a little bit of light bouncing off of it, making it kind of shiny. So we would call this a waxy or resinous luster. Next characteristic we have is hardness. Hardness is best explained when using the tools, but it's basically whether or not a specimen can be scratched by another specimen. We can use fancy pick sets now to find hardness, but Frederick Mose, who invented what's called the Mose Hardness Scale, created a series of gradations for hardness. So he put the softest minerals with an arbitrary number of one. So here we have talc. And something like talc, like I said, can be made into a powder. It's scratched very easily. You can just scratch it with your fingernail. And there we go. Talc is not very hard at all. But something like quartz, quartz is much harder. You can scratch a piece of glass with this one. So with hardness, it's sort of what can be scratched, what's scratchier, what can get scratched. And so we'll go through the application of the tools, showing both the traditional Mohs hardness toolkit, as well as our new hardness numbers pick sets. So hardness is how easily can a mineral be scratched? Can it scratch something else? Can something else be scratched by it? Lastly, we have special properties. So special properties would be how heavy a specimen is. This is lead-based, so it's incredibly heavy compared to something like this. It has a high specific gravity. This one here is calcium carbonate, and it would fizzle if I were to put hydrochloric acid on it. I'll do that in our mineral ID video, but this Specifically, because it is a carbonate, as we'll see in our carbonates video, it'll react with acid. However, this one, although it looks really similar, will not because this one is sodium chloride. So if you got down to the very end and you can't quite tell because they have similar luster, similar color, similar cleavage, and similar hardness, you can't tell which one is which, that's when you start looking into special properties such as effervescence with acid or magnetism. So when you get down to the special properties, that's when you can really weed out exactly what your mineral is.